Hey y'all and welcome back to Grains and Grit. Today, a bit different of a video, I'm just basically going to bring you into my kitchen and we're going to be cooking up some things, baking up some things. We're baking large loaves of bread and rolls and making some peas and I'm actually going to be frying up some venison, talking to y'all about how I like to fry things. Also, some tips about freezing bread for if you do want to do some batch cooking and just overall a cook and bake with me. So feel free to go into your kitchen and start baking or cooking or whatever you would like to do. And I'll just be there as your friend in the kitchen cooking alongside of you. So welcome back y'all and welcome if you are new. So this video is actually different than one I usually do. So for those who are new, hi, my name is Felicia and I teach all about real whole grains from a biblical perspective. So I mill my own wheat, bake bread. I use freshly milled wheat and freshly milled grains for like everything in my life. So this video is actually more of a cook and bake with me, kind of just showing y'all how I do this in real life. So one example here um, is that here I, we were given this massive venison ham by my new favorite neighbor. Um, but even this entire ham is too much for even my family for one meal. This is multiple meals for us. So what I'm doing here is just processing this venison roast for, um, we're going to be do, frying up some venison bits, which is just think venison nuggets super one of our favorites and yes I use freshly milled wheat whenever I fry some things and I'll be showing that to y'all later the other half we're just going to be saving as a roast for another meal later on and so just join me y'all I'm going to be kind of walking y'all through things also music so you can just cook or bake along with me okay so I got all my bits done for venison bits that I'm going to be doing um, I think I am doing that tonight. And so now I'm working on this since this made kind of like a nice roast. I'm just going to freeze it as a roast. So when we do this, so that's one meal for my large family. Going to have a large family. Obviously, if I was smaller, I just cut it in half. But I'm going to trim all of this stuff off and then probably just put this in a Ziploc bag and stick it in the freezer. And this stuff, I do still have a few little bits that I need to do to add to here. And we're going to put them in the fridge for tonight. Okay, so I can cross off the venison off my list. <laughs> um, okay, so I need what to do next. Okay, so I have some things I put on the list that I need to thaw. I can do that later tonight so they can be thawing. Um, but now I think I'm going to start doing all the prep work and stuff. So I need to roll some oats for... Something I'm making tomorrow. Oh, the apple crisp <laughs> that I'm making tomorrow. I want to go ahead and chop a lot of the vegetables that I need for these dishes tomorrow. So that way I don't have to worry about that. Um, I've got a ham. I'm going to go ahead and dice that up so I can get that out of the way. I might go ahead and shred some of my cheese. Although I do it in my food processor. So it's not like it would take that much time. Um, and then probably go ahead and get started. Let's see, it's almost two o'clock. So... <laughs> I know it seems to be taking me all morning just to do that venison, but we were, this is a Friday, so we were still homeschooling this morning. Um, all the things going on with the kids and then preparing lunch and everything like that. So what you were seeing is what I was doing while um, I was here helping my kids with whatever school that they had. Um, so let's get started on miscellaneous prep work. So as I usually do, whenever I do things like this, is I tend to just overcommit. Like, yeah, 
I've totally got this. We can totally do this. But y'all, this is my very first time actually doing where I was wanting to do like the freezer meals and stuff like that. So a lot of these freezer meals um, I did do the next day, but that's another video. So today I'm just doing, I'm just kind of getting together like what all I need to cut up. I'm just gathering up my ingredients, getting a list for my husband because he had to pick some things up while he was out for me and um, keep honing my knives. I just, I'm always honing my knives, but I'm also going to show y'all guys, I finally have tried out a new trick for onions. So this is kind of a chef's tip where you peel the onions, you kind of cut it down halfway, and then I'm needing to dice. So now I'm just kind of slicing in kind of the sizes that I want and then dice it up like this. And I have to say, this is actually a great way to do this. This is now I'm going to help dice up onions from now on. Um, I'll slow it down here in a bit, but basically you're just, you're peeling them all and this is, I'm slowing them down, cut them in half, but you still have that little tip on it. That's kind of your handle. And then with a very sharp knife, you're going to go down mostly like halfway down the oven, uh, down the oven, down the onion. Um, and then this is the vertical slices here. So you do like a horizontal slice and then the vertical slices. And then now you're ready to dice up, but you kind of fold your, for me, it's my left hand there. Um, I'm kind of folding my fingers under sort of, so I don't cut them and they're moving as I go back. And that very tip I discard and then now I have these wonderful diced onions and I was actually getting a lot faster as I was going and this was a great way to do it. So I'm just dicing up the onions here per meal that I need and I'm putting them in containers so that way the next day I just need to pull out that container for whatever I'm dish I'm making and I already have my diced onions. So I feel like I'm improving here. Check me out. Yes. So let me know in the comments below if you have any tips about doing all of these onions and not crying your eyeballs out because there were a ton of onions <laughs> that I had to cut up today. Um, we also had to do some celery and then I think, I think we've got garlic coming up as later. So basically, again, these are just recipes that I'm going to be using for freezer meals and prepping as much as I can today. I also had to stop for lunch and then I needed some mayo. So I made some mayonnaise, which y'all, if you don't make your own mayonnaise, you should. It's just crazy easy to do. But now we're going to go ahead and get started with rolling the oats for things that I need. So I did a video all about this, how I do roll my oats, but this is the attachment to my Bosch Universal Mixer Plus to be able to do the oats. And this is definitely not enough. So I'm going to hand this off to one of my kids to go grab me some more and it'll magically show up later. So I believe in this one, I needed to roll up about, um, I think eight cups of oats and I found out that usually one cup of oat groats equals to about one and a quarter to one and a half cups of rolled oats and so basically I was just rolling them until I had enough and while they're rolling I'm taking some of the ham that I'm going to be using the next day for some egg muffins I'm going to just go ahead and be dicing that up also checking on the oats that are being rolled because it does take a little bit of time to do that, but that allowed me to kind of baby it a little bit and also talk to my husband who you see here. But this is actually, I'm um, just showing you all a close up of the oat groats just going through. Again, these are oat groats. They look a lot like wheat berries and they're just rolled out to make rolled oats. And then from here, I can chop them up further to make quick oats. But y'all, if you're not doing this already, I do highly recommend a flaker because they're just so fresh and tasty. And I'm just kissing on my husband here because um, he's going to pick me up some groceries that I need and he's wonderful. So just saying goodbye to him and talking with him. But we're just, again, just going to continue dicing up this ham, rolling some oats, talking to whoever's in the kitchen with me and just get it all done. done with all the oats we're just actually going to store them in a gallon size glass jar so I don't have to use up a plastic bag these I got from Azure Standard love them recommend them and we're gonna just be putting them aside for later 
my husband just got back with groceries that I needed. Yay. So I can keep going. Um, but I think right now I'm going to start actually making the pretzels. So again, this is a Jill Winger recipe from her Prairie Homestead cookbook. And I'm going to be converting it. So with my conversion, that means that I'll be able to actually list this recipe for y'all. So if it turns out well, I will give y'all a printable recipe. If it doesn't turn out well, I'll have to figure it out and give y'all a recipe at another time. So we are going to do this. This is on page 176 of her Prairie Homestead cookbook. And to kind of give you an idea of how I want to convert things is first of all, I always consider what I'm making. So this does, um, these are soft pretzels, by the way, right off the bat, I know I'm going to want a soft texture and I want it to be light as possible. So I'm actually going to go with soft white wheat. Um, cause I think that will work out pretty well. The recipe calls for all purpose flour. So I know that it's not needing bread flour, like for the high gluten content. So that's why I think we're just going to go with soft white wheat spelt would probably work as well as Camus, but we're just going to make it easy on myself and do soft white wheat today. So let's talk a little bit about recipe conversions and just kind of walk you through my process. So whenever I have a recipe like this, that's just calling for all purpose flour, bread flour, I like to make notes, but I don't necessarily like in a cookbook want to make them permanent. So I just use sticky notes here and write down what I'm doing. So that way I can go in and tweak. And then once I actually get it down the way that I want it, then I actually make the notes in the actual cookbook. Or um, if I type it up on my website, I then just print that out and put it in my recipe binder. Um, but this is just how I do it. I just take notes and I do recommend that if you are converting any sort of recipe, just take notes along the way. I actually keep a notepad and pencil in my kitchen to always just just take notes with whatever recipe I'm doing. I just take notes and I say like, this is the wheat I used, all of that to see um, how it works. So that way I don't forget, especially whenever I do it and it turns out amazing. And then I forgot what I did and can't duplicate it. So I learned that lesson the hard way. Learn from me, take notes in the kitchen. So when it turns out amazing, you know how to do it. I have to admit this is not feeling as soft as I think it should which may be an indication that I just I just added too much flour however this is going to rest actually it's not it's not too bad it's not bad but it is going to rest which does allow the gluten to soften and everything so I hope that that helps it feel a bit more soft because you can see it's kind of like breaking a little bit but we do have this rest period, so I'm not gonna need it further because it is also a possibility. I may have over kneaded it a little bit, but I don't I don't think so. I'm going on gut instinct here. So I'm just gonna pop it in a bowl. It says to rise, warm place for about 45 minutes. So we are going to do just that. Okay, so it's about, look at the clock behind it, 4.10 right now. So I actually need to start getting ready for supper. So I have right here the pretzel dough, dough that is rising, that'll rise just fine. So for supper tonight, I'm actually gonna be frying up the um, venison bits. And I'm gonna be teaching y'all how I fry using freshly milled wheat. And pretty much what I'm gonna show you is the same format pretty much that I use for chicken nuggets, chicken strips, fried chicken. Um, it just, what varies is your cooking time, but otherwise the actual flour mixture and how I fry, pretty much the same. Um, so take note. Um, I'm also gonna be doing some baked Parmesan potatoes, which I believe is a recipe that is available to the Grainy Bunch. If you're one of my grainies, this recipe is there. It is super, super good, but that is 
the oven. And then I'm also going to be cooking up some of uh, these field peas that I have. I love these. I call them field peas. That's pretty much what we call them here. Let me know what you call these. These come available around the summertime around here and there's different varieties. You have white acre, purple hole, I mean, a huge variety. Bottom line is it's a field pea and I love it. And I'm going to throw in some bacon here and a lot of salt. And that's just going to cook up and it's going to be delicious. So fried venison, this, obviously some bread, which <laughs> I need to make more of. So we're probably going to get some bread going, a mixture of, um, I'm, I'll use some of that for loaves and then some of that for rolls so we can go in and have it tonight. Um, but the baked Parmesan meat potatoes need about an hour to cook. These are just, the field peas are just on the stove top. Um, and then I can go ahead and prep the venison. Thankfully, they're already cut up. They're already in the fridge. So all I need to do is just do the flour mixture and then we need to get our oil heated. And for the sake of time, I've asked my husband if he could deep fry them in the big fryer outside. So I think that's still the plan. <laughs> he will be doing that for me because it's bigger and it, it just goes by much faster. They actually don't take long at all to fry because they're small. Um, you just really need them in there for like 15, 20 seconds and then you pull them out. And that's the best I find, especially with venison. Venison can be tricky because um, it can be like too tough. So I'll go ahead and tell you, let's just talk about, let's just talk about frying up some venison. So first of all, I find that the leg meat does better. I do not use random bits of venison when I fry it because it tends to just be too tough. And that leg meat tends to do very well. You could also do the back strap, but I like to save the back strap for things like fajitas or, you know, something a bit fancier than, um, just frying it up. <laughs> So the thing is, so again, with venison, as I mentioned, whenever you fry it, especially, I really took the time to make sure like all those little white um, tendons and stuff was off because when you fry those, it's just, it just comes off as tough. Um, I don't have a problem with gamey meat. Uh, just personally don't have a problem, but if that is an issue to you, um, I do know my dad has a recipe that he did where he would soak it and I believe it's one part Catalina dressing and two parts is it French or Italian dressing I can't remember I think it was I think it was Italian dressing um, and that worked really well but um, you can also soak it in milk that's another thing so if you want to do it and then like overnight soak it in milk I got to put it I put it in buttermilk anyway uh, buttermilk and egg mixture anyway before I put it in the flour mixture. So either way, it's not going to hurt anything. I haven't had any problems, but I'll go ahead and tell you, gaminess generally comes from how it is hunted. So as long as you have a good hunter <laughs> who knows the best way to kill and process, then you should be fine. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And whenever I'm ready to mix up the flour mixture for frying, I'll walk you guys through that. But we're going to get this, these peas going and then also the potatoes, preheat the oven, do that first. Oh, and also get started on some bread. Now I will say with these peas, these were already blanched and prepared for, or actually not, I don't think they were particularly blanched. They were just washed, rinsed very, very well. Um, some peas, there were other ones that I have, and I don't know if it's because of the type of pea or maybe they just weren't washed, but I have to really, really wash them because, and you'll really know if they were washed well, because as this cooks, if you see foam rising, foam usually indicates impurities. So you're not going to die. Um, you just need to scoop off any foam. But to these field peas, you don't even have to thaw them out. And they actually don't take that long to cook. But I do like to make sure that I've got an hour set aside just in case. And you're going to want generous amount of salt. This is probably... A good tablespoon. This is two pounds of peas. That's probably a good tablespoon, maybe even a little bit more. And then plus we add in some bacon. Now you can leave out the bacon, but you will also leave out the joy. So that is completely up to you, but just know you have been forewarned that the bacon is what 
really gives it that flavor. Or ham hock, if you got a ham hock or some ham. I just have bacon right now. And so that's what I'm going to use. And I have to say, like, when my grandmother would make these grown up, my grandmother would make these grown up. And I loved to, like, pick out. Uh, I just loved eating the bacon that was in the peas. Now, the amount of bacon is up to you. This is where you just follow your heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, but I do not believe that applies when it comes to cooking. Uh, so we're going to add, I think this is about, yeah, we got four strips of bacon here. I'm just kind of cutting them up. You can cut them up smaller. You can cut them up bigger. It really doesn't matter. I mean, whatever you are wanting, I kind of just plop them in here like this. You can see here, I probably could have gone with less bacon, but you know, following my heart today, following the heart. So don't follow your heart in anything else except cooking. <laughs> and now we're just going to let that come to a boil and then I just simmer it until they're done. And like I said, um, it usually can take, um, you know, um, maybe 30 minutes at most, depends on how it's simmering and boiling. And then after this, you just test for seasoning. If you want more salt, add more salt or pepper or, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. I do like to add a little onion. We're going to add in, let me find it over here. Yeah, we're going to add in some onion powder. I never learned exactly how my grandmother made these because they were my favorite. But one day I added in onion powder and I felt like I was a little bit closer <laughs> to how it was. So onion powder, I'm going to add in a little bit of garlic. Again, follow thy heart when it comes to Southern cooking, because that's how we all do it. That's how we all do it. Okay, now we come bring it a bowl <laughs> simmer until these are done. And when it simmers, I do like to add a lid. So I will have that ready to go. Now on to the potatoes, and I'm gonna mill some more wheat to um, start with the bread. All right, so here's the deal. I'm not sure if you can see my face, so forgive me if I'm cut off, but I'm not washing my bowl because this was just from the pretzels. I'm just baking bread and I just did it. So I'm going to save myself a step, not wash the ball. Now, as you can see, um, if you saw, I might remember my list. I was wanting to also make bread for my friends having babies. So I'm actually going to go ahead and make the maximum amount that I can, which on my recipe cheat sheet, I have that it makes three loaves. I can actually usually squeeze out five smaller loaves. Um, I probably will still have to bake bread again tomorrow because I need it for my family and I don't want to do it on Sunday. So, um, but the very least we're going to make rolls out of this. The rest of it, we're going to make loaves. They can be cooling. I'll decide if it's for us or my friends and we'll freeze them. I did get some tips from people about freezing the loaves because I personally have never done that. Yay. So we're going to get this where this is proofing the yeast. So I'll link my recipe cheat sheet here. I need to update it because it says for three loaves, but again, I can do four or even five loaves. Um, so yeah, really, really need to update that thing. And I actually thought of doing a video soon of showing y'all, um, how to do like the, the exact ingredients list. So I may just make another cheat sheet completely of ingredients list for one, two, three, four, and even five loaves because that's the maximum that the Bosch will take and probably the Ankh as well. Okay, so we're doing three. I need some more yeast. Three and a quarter tablespoons of instant yeast. So I'm gonna use the rest of what's in this bag. Now, do you know, I personally love stainless steel measuring cups and spoons because I beat the tar out of them and I've broken so many plastic ones and four jars now has their own stainless steel spoons and measuring cups. And I love them. And I believe I have a discount code for y'all. I will link that down below. Oh, got to deal with my peas here. Because they are coming up. These are going. Okay, I've already got one tablespoon in here. Welcome to what I'm typically doing in my kitchen. I'm just running around doing all kinds of different things. Okay, so let's... Now this is the Fleischmann's brand of yeast. I can get at Sam's Club. Um, I usually am getting the, uh, is, it the... is it Red Star? Well, one of the other brands, I had a stock from Pleasant Hill Grain. 
but I recently ran out. I'm going to be placing another order soon because I love having it in bulk, in stock. This is the instant yeast. Okay, so let me mix that up. Okay, so one, two, and three. A little bit for the quarter. And I'm going to replace my bag for the yeast because that has seen better days. And it has lived a good long life. So this is how I like to freeze my yeast, even though I go through them very fast. I'm not going to have yeast go bad, but I want to store it where it's vacuum sealed. And then when I open it, I found, I put it in a Ziploc baggie because I can't tell you how often I've spilt this thing. So at least if it spills, it's in a Ziploc bag. Okay. And then just close that up. And then I just keep this in my freezer and I have never had a problem with it going bad at all. Five and three quarter cups of warm water. So got to get that warmed up. Now, do you know that the wheat I'm using, I'm using hard white wheat. This is from Four Generations Organic Farms. If you're curious, um, never had a problem with it. It tastes great. I do have a coupon code for y'all. I'll list it here. Um, and then the soft white wheat that I had, I believe that was from, yeah, I think we got it from the, the soft white wheat from uh, Pleasant Hill Grain. Uh, so that's also great as well. I don't have a coupon code y'all for that but you can go to grainsandgrit.com slash phd to shop with them they're super super clean wheat berries not these are this video is not sponsored by anyone my own opinion but um yeah they're really great uh now do know i will give you a hint for pleasant hill grain so make sure you sign up for their email list because they frequently send out coupon codes that are only exclusive to their email list so for example Recently, just the other day, they actually sent out a coupon code to their email subscribers for 20% off of wheat berries. And I'm not allowed to share that with you guys. It is just for email subscribers. So be on the lookout for that. I've seen it for the Berkey water filters, for wheat berries, for um, mixers, all kinds of different things that are exclusive only to email. All right. And y'all know the drill by now. We let this sit. Or oh, we got to mix it up. I think... Um, we then mix this up. Now, usually this is behind me in my baking station. I do not have it here. This is just for the video. Mix it up. We are going to let that sit for, it's kind of warm today, so I'm just going to do 15 minutes. Okay, and now we're going to get started on those Parmesan potatoes. Change of plans, forgot. I have no Parmesan for Parmesan potatoes and <laughs> you gotta have that. So I'm gonna, um, we're just gonna roast. We're just gonna roast some potatoes. And I'm gonna wing it. We are gonna wing it, see how this goes. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm kinda gonna go by memory of what I do with like the Parmesan potatoes. I'm just going to do that, but without the Parmesan. So I'm going to be adding like different seasonings and stuff. So we're, we're winging it here. I'm going to take a whole stick of butter and we're going to put this in the oven. 425 is preheating. I'm going to put that in the oven to melt yellow potatoes. I like yellow or red potatoes because you don't have to kill them, kill them when. Okay. like them about just a good bite size here set those aside red and yellow potatoes are also a bit lower on the glycemic index so for those of you with sugar issues need to watch that these are better than your typical white idaho potato they're more expensive but worth it Okay, so as you can see, the butter did not quite melt. I do not care. So I just broke it up into pieces like this. This is basically my, how I cook. I just, I just go with it, go with it. Okay, kind of spread that around because obviously this will melt a bit more. And I may need more potatoes, but I'm not really sure. I just want it. Yeah, that's a good layer right there because 
I'm going to put this in there for about 25 minutes, then um, mix everything up and then cook it for about another probably 20, 25 minutes or so. So I've actually never fully done it this way. I've only done it the Parmesan type. So we're going to do obviously salt. Now you can do this in a bowl and mix it up if you want, but it's all going to get mixed up here. Garlic powder. This is the seasonings I use when I'm frying potatoes. All right. And then onion, generous amount of onion. You'll start to see a pattern <laughs> with my cooking, especially whenever I still go to fry something. Okay. Take the lid off. There you go. Onion. Okay. And then some pepper. And I'm going to go ahead and mix this up with the butter and the seasonings. Make sure everything is nicely mixed up. Now, usually I would do two of these for my family, but we also have those peas. We've got the fried venison. We're going to have some bread. So this is obviously not the main. It's a side. So you make as much as you need to. All right. In the oven we go. Now we're just waiting on this and I'm going to go ahead and get my honey and stuff like that ready. So when this is ready, we can start mixing this up. Got to refill my salt jar. This is literally a glass jar I got from Dollar Tree. <laughs> and it works just fine for my salt. Um, this is my Redmond's salt. Uh, I like to buy it from Redmond's. I do have a coupon code if you buy it straight from Redmond's. But other places like Pleasant Hill Grain, Azure Standard, they sell it as well. I think you can also buy it at Whole Foods. But my favorite salt. I love that it's here in the US, which is cool, but it's just a really good quality salt and I use it for everything. So I will link all of that for you guys. So we're just gonna do this and put this back. Okay, so for all of these loaves, I'm gonna need la, 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 la. four and three quarter teaspoons salt. So three teaspoons equals a tablespoon. So we're gonna do that and then eyeball the rest the oil and the honey we need three quarter cups oil three quarter cups honey oh and that's my timer telling me this is done so good timing the honey i find the best bet the best deal is azure standard um that's where i'm getting it for now because i can just just get a really good deal for it and honey is expensive i hope to one day have bees of my own but for now, that's my best deal that I get. Buy it like in the gallon size and put them in these smaller jars. Okay. Add it all in. Now, this actually creates so much dough that I cannot mill it all in one mill, even in my wonder mill. So I have to, I'm going to put what I can in here and then um, go mill some more. Now, this calls for anywhere between... It says 13 and a half to 14 and a quarter cups of flour. But what I do is I basically get it up to 12 because it's pretty much all that this can handle before mixing. And then I start mixing it. And then I just go from there as normal. And I don't count how many cups of flour I need. I go until it just starts to pull off the bowl. Um, and that's when I start my kneading time. So we already added three cups of flour. So three, four... Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Just kidding. I usually can do like 10. So I basically use all the flour that I did mill and then I go mill some more while this starts mixing up. And then I just start adding it in. Um, I find that whenever I do it this full in my Bosch Universal Mixer, it is crucial that the flour really make sure it's really mixed in each time I add some more before just adding some more because it takes a bit longer for all the flour to be mixed in. But if you know how to make it, you know how to make it. It's just a much, much larger batch. help it out I'm gonna go ahead and just scrape down I do not like to leave this mixing while I'm milling up more flour I just usually like mix it up enough stop it finish milling and then add some more 
So we're gonna scrape this down to help it. And I am gonna start, um, I'm gonna put this on the two setting for my Bosch. So usually I need on the one, but this is a lot of dough. So we're going up to two. going to add just a little bit more. I can always add more after the kneading process if I need to, like by dusting my hands and things like that, if it's just too sticky. But I'm going to leave it right here and then we're going to knead for nine minutes. All right, so I hope that y'all can hear me while the Bosch is mixing up that bread. And while it does that, let's talk about Fran. <laughs> So what I have is I actually do like to use soft white wheat when it comes to frying things. Uh, I just find that a hard wheat is um, like you can see that bran a bit more. And yeah, it's just it's just a feel. It's just a gut feeling. I just prefer soft white wheat for these things. You could also possibly use kamu or spelt, but uh, kamu or spelt is not as mild of a flavor as a soft white wheat, which is also what we're going for. We're not here to really taste the breading. We're here to taste the seasonings and the actual food that we're frying. So um, to the flour, this is soft white wheat. And this is why I can't do, it's hard to do a video because I don't, I don't know my measurements. <laughs> um, I just kind of, I kind of go by, I go by taste. The bottom line is we're going to add, this looks to be about maybe five or six cups of soft white wheat flour. And to that, I'm going to just add in my salt i do use the redmond salt this is probably a good tablespoon or more and then we need garlic powder which we need a good amount of that probably about two tablespoons and then a whole lot of onion powder i find that the onion powder is what is really crucial um and then to that i just mix it up by hand And then here's how I know if it's good. I taste it. <laughs> so make sure your hands are clean. And then I just kind of. And what I'm looking for is I'm specifically wanting to taste the onion and to make sure that it's, that it's salty enough. So I actually, I do taste the onion. This is good, but I just want a little bit more. You, I find that you want to go a little above, just a little above what you think it should be because I find that frying it mellows out those flavors a little bit. So I'm just going to add probably another tablespoon or so of onion and some more salt. Uh, let's mix this all up here. All right. Taste it again. Again, it's for my family. It's okay. It's okay. Oh yeah, that's good. So I now taste that it's, that it is salty, not crazy. If you find, usually in cooking, when you find that something is missing, it's usually salt. <laughs> so I did salt that. That may be, actually nothing but it might be a little too much, but that is okay because that's how we prefer it anyway. Um, but you do it to taste, but I find it's the onion powder, the garlic powder, and the salt. It's a soft white wheat flour milk fine, and that's what we're going for. So, um, and then the oil, fry at 350 degrees for venison and for venison bits. Again, these are like little nuggets of venison, um, usually very quick, like in, out. I mean, like we're talking 15 seconds or so. It doesn't need much because they're in such small bite-sized pieces. They are cooked through. We're not wanting well done. If you want it well done, burnt through, Chris, apologize to the deer, but do as you wish. <laughs> So I'm not going to take y'all out to the fryer because it's outside and it's annoying to move my camera, but we're going to do that outside in the fryer just to make it go faster. We're going to go in and start heating up that oil. Again, you want it around 350. My husband usually does the deep fryer, so he has like his own technique than if I was to fry it here in the house. Um, but if I am not correct on what he does, that I, I will let you guys know. Um, the peas are doing really well. It's almost time for me to flip the potatoes. We got the um, stuff going for the meat. Gonna be a little late for supper tonight, but it'll be worth it. Oh, one thing I did forget to mention is how 
how to batter it. So there's multiple ways of doing this. How I do it is I usually just have the meat in cultured buttermilk. You can use regular milk. It's totally fine. But I find just the cultured buttermilk is a little bit thicker. If you're using regular milk, add in some egg to thicken that up to help that stay. And I dump it in here in my flour mixture, shake off any excess and then fry it. I just, I generally just keep it pretty simple. There's many different ways to fry things. That's just what I find that we like. Um, and that's, that's how we do it. Yeah, that's how we do it here. Some people do it where they actually put it in mustard and then the flour mixture and then fry it. Uh, some people do it with all egg and then the flour mixture and then fry it. So find what you like and what works for you. But this is the same mixture that I do for my chicken. If I'm frying up my chicken, whether it's whole chicken, chicken nuggets, chicken strips, or the fried venison, and it can be bigger chunks of venison. It's how I do my country fried steak. It's, it's just my go-to way of frying up stuff. So here we are, we're just checking on the potatoes. I just like to rotate them about halfway through. They're actually looking pretty good. So we'll see how they taste later. Um, and then while all this is happening, it's now time to make the bread. So here I am actually making the rolls. I did do a video about this, about how I do my rolls. So you, if you need to slow down to see how I roll it. And I can do two rolls at once on the counter. That's cool. Do know if you're gonna do this, uh, make sure that it's not a floured surface where the dough is sliding around all the time. It does need to be like nothing on there. So if you need a bit of flour, just add it to your hands to be able to do that. But that definitely takes practice. All right, now I generally do not weigh my loaves, but with this much dough, I find I just, I, I don't eyeball it as well. So we are going to weigh these doughs just to see, to determine um, how many loaves I'm wanting to do. Or how many I, I can do. Okay, so this is, this is tacky, but as you can see, I'm able to work with it and able to move it out. That's a good dough. It's a lot of dough, but it's a good One pound six, one pound nine. I usually weigh them all first before I start adjusting and then go from there. One eleven. One eleven. I have to say I'm good. <laughs> We're just going to take a little bit from each of these and put it with that. And that was probably going to be just fine. So I usually like my bread loaves to be around one pound, like almost a two pounds, so like one and a half pounds, almost to two pounds. And I find that that makes a good size, a good size loaf. So I only grabbed three loaf pans, so I need to grab another one. So the bread pans that I'm using today is, are my, um, my USA pan bread loaves. And then these are my Pampered Chef stoneware. So this is still new and not quite seasoned. So for now I do spray it, but I do not have to spray my USA pans because they are a silicone, non-stick pan and I love them. I love them very much. So let's get these in the bread pans. And as far as how to freeze them, I reached out to y'all on Instagram and asked how y'all freeze my loaves. And I reached out to Michael Gropp, who also freezes. Um, and she does all about fresh milled wheat as well. If you do not follow her, do. I did an interview with her on this channel. It was absolutely amazing how she cured her autoimmune disease. Both of them, she had two. Um, but how she said to do it is she goes ahead and slices it up and then wraps it all in plastic wrap and then puts it in a plastic freezer safe Ziploc bag. And other people say that they actually freeze the whole loaf wrap it up very tight in plastic wrap and then put it like in foil or a Ziploc bag or something like that um, and then freeze it whole. Obviously you're doing all this after it completely cools but um, they were saying doing that and then how to saw it from the whole loaf they said that they usually just put it on their counter overnight and that it's great. Again I've never tried it. I've 
I've been a little eh, freezing loaves and stuff, but I'm looking forward to trying it myself because I'm making bread like every other day. And I now usually have to make like this much bread every other day um, or the equivalent of. So some of the times it's rolls, sometimes it's cinnamon rolls, you know, things like that. But um, this is what I'm up to now because large family mama, we got a lot of mouths to feed around here. So those are the two different ways. I haven't decided which way. I, I reached out to Michael um, and asked her how she thaws it with it being sliced like that. And I haven't, as of recording, I haven't heard back. I haven't been able to check either. So I will keep y'all updated with how she thaws it being sliced. I do know a friend of mine, she would just slice my bread loaves and then she would put it in like a Ziploc baggie. And then she would just pull out one slice straight from the freezer and toast it. And she said that was great. So let me know, comment below if you have frozen breads, cinnamon rolls, English muffins, um, anything like that. Let me know if you have frozen any type of bread product with freshly milled wheat specifically and let us know how it goes, how you like it, how to thaw it, um, how it is compared to fresh bread, all the things. Comment below. We, we need to know. All right, these are done. So cover it up and let them rise before baking. And because my stove is now crowded, we're going to have to leave them here. So now it's time to go ahead and prep all this venison to be fried. So what you see here is I'm adding some cultured buttermilk to this. Now you can just use milk, like I said earlier, just whatever you're doing, I'm putting them in. I did find I didn't quite have enough buttermilk. I didn't want to open up another container. So I just added a little bit of regular milk and then some egg. I mean, bottom line, you're just needing to get it where it's going to stick on to, um, to the meat. So then the flour will stick on. And then I'm just preparing my pan here with paper towels for whenever my husband pulls it out of the fryer. You dump it on paper towels so any grease can drain. And then here's also another hack that I do where I sometimes, for large batches like this, I actually just have like a paper grocery bag and I put all my venison in there or whatever I'm frying. I got the flour mixture in the paper sack. We add the wet stuff in there and then we just shake the devil out of it to get it all up. And I had to go in there on my tippy toes a little bit to mix it up by hand. You don't want to make sure that it's all clumped together. So make sure it's individual. And here we are. The rolls are done. The potatoes are done. We're bringing those things out. We're putting the loaves in. Um, thankfully, I am able to fit four loaves into my oven. And so we're doing all that. I'm also just brushing the rolls with some butter. And then here we are. The peas look amazing and they are so good as well the potatoes actually turned out great as well i was extremely pleased they're just simple nothing fancy and then here we have the rolls i like to serve them hot absolutely hot and they are super nice and soft like you see here squishy squishy and then we have the venison this was so good my husband fried it up no problem and we had a wonderful meal so we did it y'all. Um, if you made it this far to the video, God bless you for watching this whole thing. <laughs> or maybe you just, the point of these, again, I actually love uh, turning these type of videos on, like the cook with me, the bake with me, even like all those cleaning videos. I don't know if you've seen, because it feels like I have a friend with me as I just do my task in the kitchen, around the house, whatever it is. So that's kind of the main point with these, but also just give you some tips, walk you through kind of how this looks like, what it looks like in my kitchen more on a day-to-day -day basis, um, especially with using real whole grains, fresh and milled wheat, all of those things. I did, I have been recording the freezing meal, meals that I've made, um, including freezing bread and everything. So um, hopefully I will be posting that soon as well. Gotta look at my schedule here. But let me know what you think. Do you like these type of videos? What would you like to see? More actual freezer meals? Just tips and tricks as I go about my day. How I use, how I cook in my kitchen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just kind of let me know. I want to hear your thoughts. Comment below. But again, thank y'all so very much for watching this video. And I will see y'all next week. Bye.